Opinions expressed on this program represent the viewpoints of individual authors or contributors and do not necessarily reflect those of Troy University. Welcome to eConversations. I'm your host, Dr. Dan Sutter of the Johnson Center for Political Economy at Troy University. Spring football is returning to the United States with the launch of the Alliance of American Football. As a football fan, I'm very excited to have something to watch after the Super Bowl. And the organizers of the league are hoping to capture, on the, capture this pent-up demand as well. The return of spring football illustrates an important issue in economics, if you can believe it. If the alliance proves successful, a natural question will be, why didn't anyone do this earlier? And if so, what other great ideas and products are not, are, are not being brought to us through the market? These are challenging questions for economists to an attempt to answer, and they have significant implications for the performance of our economy. Progress and rising standards of living result largely from the new, new products, new ways to make old products, new ways to organize businesses or raise capital. How can we ever know if our economy is discovering everything it should be discovering in any sense? Joining me on this episode of eConversations is Dr. John Dove, the Manuel H. Johnson Professor of Economics with the Johnson Center. Welcome back to the show, John. Thanks for having me, Dan. And today you're going to ask me some questions, right? That's right. And as you are, I'm very excited about the uh, Alliance for American Football. Uh, obviously, after the Super Bowl, most people want to want to see some additional football, but don't have it. So you know, I think given that, it's a great opportunity for everybody. Um, so to that, then you know, how exactly you know, can you talk about this alliance a little bit, this football league, and, and how exactly it did come about? Yeah. So it, it was uh, it was just launched here in uh, 2019, and it, it was uh, the brainchild of uh, a couple of gentlemen with a very distinguished past. One is Charlie Ebersol there in the top. And, and the other is uh, Bob Ursay, uh, the uh, uh, formerly general manager of a number of different teams mm -hmm. in, in the uh, NFL. So um, Charlie Ebersol is the uh, son of a famous uh, sports producer for NBC Sports, uh, Dick Ebersol. He's got a background in uh, media and, and, and sports. And they, they have hit upon this idea that uh, you know, they recognize that we have this, uh, in, in, in the U.S., we have this like six or almost seven month dead period mm -hmm. uh, for football fans after the end of the Super Bowl and then before the, the start of the college football season or, or the, the pro football season really in September. So it's almost seven months and there are lots of football fans and on top of that now you also have uh, fantasy football, you have uh, sports betting that's in, uh, being legalized by more and more states so the opportunities for people to bet. And, and people want to, you know, whether watch or, or do fantasy football or, or bet on football, have nothing to bet on for, for s uh, six or seven months. Mm -hmm. And so they, they thought that there would be a significant uh, fan interest in, that they hoped to tap into. And uh, they, in, in addition to the, uh, the sort of co-founders having strong NFL roots, they've tapped on, uh, into a lot of former NFL players, uh, players like Heinz Ward and, and, and Jared Allen. Uh, I think Heinz Ward is director of the player um, development. Uh, and, and so you're tapping into some uh, players with uh, NFL background and then also uh, coaches with either NFL or the significant college background as well. So uh, they're attempting to put on a league that looks a lot like the NFL but simply mm -hmm. with some not quite NFL ready players. So what then specifically, especially since these aren't really NFL already, kind of a minor league then, you know, what, what is it about this league that the organizers think will actually end up then making it a success? Well, I, I think first off there's, a, as I mentioned, the demand. The, right. the, so I think they can tap into that. And you know, then they also have a, a structure in place that I think uh, makes it a good amount of sense. They have a set salary scale across the, uh, across the league. And they have the league itself owns all the the, the eight different mm -hmm. teams in the league, so uh, you don't have any issues about cross uh, rivalries of one owner versus another trying to, to blow up the salary scale. So they mm -hmm. have this set salary, and without uh, owners trying to re 
recruit or, or get players for their team and out outbidding the others. Uh, they should be able to stick to that salary scale. They have a, a television contract and, and, and so, in fact, if, if you look at the revenues that you, you think, they should be able to look at the revenues they're going to be able to generate from television and other media. And then the, once they have the salary scale set, uh, you know, they are paying some uh, big name coaches, so they have some expenses mm -hmm. there. But if, if you can keep your uh, salaries in line with uh, revenues, I mean, you would expect that they should be able to uh, at least uh, break even and, and make some money. Does this rationale then overall make sense? It certainly does to me. I mean, as I look at it, it's like, you know, I, I see a lot that uh, certainly makes sense. And, you know, as a football fan, I certainly know I miss out on, on football for these months. I, I'll, I'll start watching Canadian football when it, it's available mm -hmm. and, and, and whatever happens to be available. But, uh, you know, it certainly se seems like uh, I, th I think they have a, a good shot to, to make some money. Yeah, and so I guess, you know, kind of following that up then, we've obviously seen leagues, at least uh, on some margin, similar to this in the past. We've seen the USFL, the XFL, and obviously, you know, both of those were largely flops, uh, you know, initially at least had some success, but largely flopped. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, given that, you know, why, why is it that we saw those leagues fail? And then also, you know, kind of a follow-up to that is, you know, why is it that it took so long for somebody else to come along with, you know, another another attempted uh, off-season football league. Yeah, so certainly the uh, USFL was launched in 1983, and I mean, the the AAF has really sort of built itself as a, a developmental league, and so they see themselves very much as a, a supplement or auxiliary to the uh, mm -hmm. NFL, trying to give players who haven't quite been able to make it to the NFL a chance to at least play and, and hone their skills and then also you know hopefully develop some uh, fans who, who mm -hmm. want to like watch that. The USFL made much more of an effort to try to rival the NFL uh, right out of the gate and, and so they signed uh, in a number of, of Heisman Trophy winning uh, players or, or uh, very high uh, players who were very much sought after for the NFL like Herschel Walker from from th this part of the country mm -hmm. Uh, you know, jumped to the the USFL to play for the New Jersey Generals, and I think it was like three years in a row the uh, Heisman Trophy winner didn't end up. It went to the USFL as opposed to the NFL, hmm. and and so you know that meant higher salaries and you know, the higher salaries and you know, then a, a lack of stability with ownership. So I mean, th there might have been some uh, problems there with that, and, and that XFL I mean, really sort of tried to, uh, I think, brand itself very differently. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, Vince McMahon with his uh, background from wrestling, I mean, really, it was very much different. Uh, mm -hmm. Although similar, you know, though basically football, they're, they're certainly uh, trying to market very, very differently and not with like the close ties uh, that you have to the NFL, with the, which we have for the AAF. So I think that, you know, kind of a, then, you know, with that follow-up question, trying to think about why why has it been so long since we've seen another league? Because, you know, for economists, and this is something I try to you know uh, convey to my students, is you know obviously, you know, in most instances, if there is a profit opportunity that is available, right, it should probably already be capitalized on. So it's kind of a perplexing question then as to you know if if you do have like this new idea or product, even like well, why isn't already being done? And so I think you know how how might we be able to kind of lead that into thinking about the the AAL. Uh, well that's a uh, that's an excellent point and it's a point that I you know I like to bring out uh, bring up myself because uh, if you know if, if Charlie Ebersol is right and then there's been this opportunity you know, and it could be possible uh, profitable to operate a, a league in this fashion then presumably people have been missing out on this opportunity for some time and so you know, it strongly suggests, especially you know, for those of us as, uh, as economists or other observers watching the economy, uh, we have to be very careful not to, uh, well, engage in Monday morning quarterbacking or, or mm -hmm. to second guess uh, decisions that are being made in the, the economy, and to really understand that you know, people who have thought about this carefully probably know a, a heck of a lot more about the details and mm -hmm. like whether it would make sense or not, and you know, so we should. You know, as a football fan, and at one level, I'm very enthusiastic about this. 
But it, it also should caution that, like, you know, maybe there are good reasons why this hasn't uh, worked in the past. And, you know, we certainly know that uh, the XFL and the USFL failed. Uh, you know, the XFL okay. might, is going to make a, a, a rebirth in, in 2020. So, I mean, you know, per perhaps, uh, uh, you know, Mr. McMahon sees some opportunities now to uh, to do what he was doing before and more profitably. But you know, uh, we we really need to be cautious about thinking as economists that we know what, that there are profit opportunities out there in the uh, economy. If if people aren't exploiting them, there might well be good reasons why they aren't as profitable as we think they are. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of you know thinking in terms of those profit opportunities then, and also. Tying that into you know invention and innovation, especially and in how it is that really through invention and innovation we we see kind of the, the the betterment of society and you know how is it that you know things like that really matter and and how this also might tie into you know these new you know uh, potentially profitable opportunities that we see like like this football league. Yeah, we certainly know that you know as a you know, much of our progress comes from the new. Uh, it mm -hmm. comes from stuff that. Uh, doesn't exist before, whether it be new ways to produce goods that we've, uh, that we've had around for, for years, or new products, or you know, again, new, new ways to even organize uh, businesses that allow us to do things that we couldn't do before. And, and so the, the, the new is very important, but it's also sort of hard to know like, what could have or, or should have been discovered that mm -hmm. hasn't been discovered. It, 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 you know, it's sort of like, uh, Looking to say, well, maybe mathematicians should have discovered some brilliant results that they haven't yet. But mm -hmm. it's sort of hard to criticize people. On the other hand, and say, well, how do we know what truly was possible right. until we happen to discover it? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, through that, thinking about profit and profit opportunities, especially, you know, in that the discovery of, of profit opportunities. You know, we always, at least, you know, I, I always, you know, teach my student that really is kind of the central role of the entrepreneur. So could yeah. you maybe, you know, give a discussion of, you know, how it is that the, the entrepreneur goes about, you know, evaluating and finding these profit opportunities and then, you know, kind of the, the, the connection between the two and really what the entrepreneur does. Yeah, and, and, and the entrepreneur's discovered the you know, role is really sort of to discover the new stuff. The existing stuff in the market, we sort of know creates value. And we know it, it creates value because we have a willing buyer and a willing seller. Mm -hmm. And so if McDonald's is willing to you know, produce uh, Big Macs and, and sell Big Macs, and people are willing to buy them, and you know, McDonald's has, has sold billions of, uh, has served billions of customers, we know that there's value being created there. And, and simply the fact that the willing buyer and willing seller continue to interact with each other uh, proves what we have. So, it's sort of an issue in, in the market. We know that sort of whatever the market is delivering mm -hmm. has to be worthwhile, has to be uh, uh, wor worth it. But it's really this stuff that we don't have that in some level is, is where our, our standard of living or improvements in our standard of living is tied. And then all, we also have to sort of think about is, well, could we be doing better? Is, is there, are we actually discovering everything that we could be discovering? No. And so I guess, you know, kind of going back then to your point about, you know, how it is, you know, especially as, you know, our armchair, our armchair economists trying to think through, you know, what are some of those things that should have been discovered, right? I mean, can yeah. we really even say, you know, anything to that? And it's really kind of the role then of the entrepreneur to go out and, and, and really try to pursue and determine what those things actually are. Yeah, it is very much the, the role of the uh, entrepreneur. It's, it's really highlighted in the work of uh, this gentleman, Israel Kirzner. Uh, and, and he, you know, uh, he em emphasized the, the the role of the of the entrepreneur is really sort of to discover these uh, a, a profit opportunities, or mm -hmm. to have awareness, mm -hmm. and you know, awareness or being an ability to see what isn't there but might actually be profitable. And so it's it's really sort of the entrepreneur where we were. As economists who are thinking of when we think of how the market operates, it's really sort of the entrepreneur that's coming up with the new ideas, uh, mm -hmm. who's trying to envision what isn't being done that could be done, and and, uh, and and then trying to also carry out a plan to to bring it to, to the market and see if it'll actually work. 
And so uh, this is a crucial element of uh, entrepreneurship. And, and you know, Kersner talks about this alertness and awareness mm -hmm. uh, is the, the sort of fundamental element of, uh, of the entrepreneur. When we already know that, you know, for products that already exist, we sort of already know that, that they're there. And so the entrepreneur has to have this vision and then also, again, that the ability to somehow uh, put that vision, come up with a plan for putting that vision into practice and then also at some point he's going to have to raise some funds. Now Kirshner doesn't see that as like fundamental to entrepreneurship because an entrepreneur could approach like say a venture capitalist or some other mm -hmm. investor to invest their idea. Uh, all the entrepreneur really has to have is the idea of, of what to do differently. Uh, mm -hmm. But still even if the entrepreneur's got to approach a venture capitalist then you know, the entrepreneur has to have the ability to articulate their vision and, and to do so in a convincing fashion, mm -hmm. is to make what other people want, want to invest and, uh, and convince them that there's some chance to, to be profitable in this. Huh. Yeah, so I guess, you know, also thinking about then this, this, this discovery process idea, you know, in this context, do we have any sort of examples of you know, maybe where businesses failed at this? In other words, we can think about, you know, potential uh, discovery failures. Um, that mm -hmm. resulted from from businesses not capitalizing on something. It it is extremely extremely difficult to uh, think about you know, what would actually constitute a, a failure of discovery, or mm -hmm. you know where where we would say, well, we should have learned this because you know the, the think of the old uh, advertising slogans like, oh, I could have had a V eight, mm -hmm. and, and you look at in, in that you know that represents in effect a, a failure of uh, alertness because mm -hmm. it was something like you, well, at some level you knew you could have had a V8, but then you sure forgot it at the time when you're choosing what to have, and it's after the fact you realize, oh, I, I made a mistake. And, and, and so, you know, uh, really trying to be able to document or, or know that somebody's making a mistake, especially given that as economists or observers of economic activity, we lack we know we lack all the details to be able to to say for sure whether somebody's made a mistake. So mm -hmm. we don't know, you know, if, if you know, why didn't somebody come up with the idea of the AAF uh, five years ago? Well, we don't know. We don't know that that was a mistake because we don't know what all they knew and, and what sure. all the data they had. And you know, maybe they they did some surveys of fan demand and, and really sort of suggested like, oh, there wasn't as much demand as you might think, mm -hmm. or lack of availability of stadiums, or, or whatever. There there could there are dozens of, of reasons why somebody could have thought about this very carefully and concluded that it wasn't it wasn't likely to be profitable. And as economists, uh, we really you know we have to be aware of that our lack of, of information, or sort of our ignorance. Mm -hmm. And so that makes it really difficult to look at any you know, situation out there in the uh, economy and, and make a strong case for this should have been discovered or this should have been, sure. we should have come up with this. Sure. And then, you know, uh, moving even a little bit further and a little bit more broadly, you know, how is it that uh, economists might try to think about um, first, you know, sort of the discovery function of, of an economy and how efficient that is, and then also, you know, what, what exactly is a, a discovery function? You know, if we're talking yeah. about that. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, you, you, you think about this discovery, and, and uh, you know, here's an example that I think was a really, really good one of uh, perhaps, you know, one of the best ones I can think of in, in terms of uh, discovery that didn't happen, mm. and, and that's uh, from uh, the business writer Michael Lewis's book. Uh, Moneyball, and now lots of economists, uh, economists working in sports and economics, uh, have, have studied all, all the different aspects of, of Moneyball. And in many ways, it was sort of like a, a, a write-up of uh, applying like economics uh, mm -hmm. to the business of, of baseball. But the, the point that Mr. Lewis makes um, was that beyond the details of, of how it is that. Uh, sort of this revolution in baseball occurred through sabermetrics and application of statistics. And I'd also suggest some uh, ideas from economics to, to being able to quantify the marginal value of players um, using statistics. Mm -hmm. Leaving aside those details of exactly what happened, you could ask the bigger question, well, if you're running a baseball team, you'd probably want to know what determines whether teams win or lose. And you'd probably want to study it in a systematic fashion. Because not only, you know, not only for for years they've been paying large salaries, like you know, first million dollar contracts 
we're getting out in the 1970s. You know, so mm -hmm. you know, even in the 1980s, you're talking about teams having payrolls in the tens of millions of dollars. You're paying large sums of money to players mm -hmm. um, that you may be wasting that that investment. And then mm -hmm. also beyond that, I mean, if you care about winning, if the owners of teams not only care about making money but care about winning in addition to making money, then you particularly would think you should study what uh, what uh, and systematically study what determines whether teams win or lose. And mm -hmm. it was really sort of that <coughs> like lack of interest or, or lack of, of systematic studying of, of what was making teams win or lose and instead rely, being content to rely on the guesses of uh, general managers hmm. about you know what, what was needed to put together a team that I, I think is a pretty good uh, a pretty good example of this because you, I think you really sort of say like yeah if you're running a bit if you're running a baseball team you probably want to know what's going to help your team win and if you haven't studied mm -hmm. that that's something you probably should have done. That's probably a mistake. It, sure. it may be a, a failure of discovery. Sure. And then, so how can we actually tie then all of this into evaluating economic performance over time, just in general? Yeah, well, one of the ways, you know, so, so we are f faced with this truly difficult task. How do we evaluate the discovery function? And then mm -hmm. from a comparative standpoint, we look at the, the market and uh, you know, we might say, well, okay, the market seems to be doing pretty well, but how do we know it's actually doing as well as it could? Is there some alternative way we could organize economic activity mm -hmm. that might even lead to more discovery, more new and, and, and great things? And so, I mean, one of the things you could do is just you know, attempt to document what are the, the new things that come, what are the new products and new services that come into the mm -hmm. come to the world and, and like, you know, where are they coming from? What countries are, are they coming from? Are, are they coming from uh, nations where you have a, a markets and entrepreneurs who are able to, to pursue their vision of what they think is profitable? Or are they coming from government labs or, or mm -hmm. more mm -hmm. systematic government uh, attempts to develop new things, like say you know, maybe the space program mm -hmm. or uh, other government uh, efforts? And is that then how we largely you know, as economists think about comparative institutional analysis and the importance of, of comparative institutional yeah, analysis. Yeah, and that, and that really where, where this comes down to the, the, the crucial thing. And, and to try to say, it's like, uh, it, we think that markets do a great job discovering because in part you can look to all of the, the great life-changing inventions that have, have occurred over the, you know, the last uh, hundred years or if you want to go back to the start of the Industrial Revolution all the things that have changed life and, and those mm -hmm. have largely come from a, a, a relatively free market that mm -hmm. entrepreneurs and businessmen pursuing profits and th or thinking they come up with ideas and a lot of them fail but some of them really uh, change our lives. Oh, go ahead. Oh. Well another way we could uh, attempt to look at this is you know, to look at economic statistics as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah so and that's that's kind of the sort of follow-up question then to there is, you know, thinking in terms of just, just economic freedom in general, where it does seem to be that, you know, countries and economies that are more economically free do tend to be more developed. So would that, you know, then systematically suggest that uh, it's market economies that really do then end up delivering the highest standards of living? Yeah, so, yeah, so we could look at you know, GDP, which is the, the value mm -hmm. of all the goods and services in, in an economy. GDP isn't everything, but it's a... a the things that it doesn't include itself, it's very closely uh, correlated with. So it's a really, really good way to measure sort of a progress in an mm -hmm. economy. And so, yeah, we could look at, you know, where has GDP per capita increased the most? Mm -hmm. uh, in what kinds of uh, countries? And so, or over different periods of time, we could look and say, like, when was, you know, when did the American economy grow the most? Mm -hmm. and, and try to assess uh, based on, on you know, the GDP performance, look at output, or in a sense, one outcome and say, when did we get the best outcomes? Mm -hmm. But even then, it's sort of hard to know. We certainly know that since the, the 1970s, we've had a growth slump, and particularly since uh, uh, about the, the Great Recession about 10 years ago, we, we haven't really had a, a period of any really robust economic growth uh, after the, the Great Recession. And so that might be a, a, a issue. Could the economy grow faster? You know, pr President Trump, when he was elected, was saying he, he would get the economy growing 4% a year and, and hadn't achieved 3% uh, real growth in any year under Obama. So 
you know, you, you could look at some growth and, and always ask the question, well, was that the best growth we could have had? Could we have mm -hmm. actually had even better growth? Well, hopefully then we see the AAF and, and other entrepreneurs and other entrepreneurial opportunities uh, adding to that future growth and, and future productivity. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Another thing we could also then do is, as we said, this comparative in institutional mm -hmm. analysis. I and mean, we could also just look at more practical things. And so here's a, an example of that kind of uh, comparison. And <clears throat> looking here on the left, that's uh, West Berlin and East Berlin, I think from mm -hmm. back in the 1970s probably. And at the point in time where you, could, you, you still had bombed out buildings from World War II mm -hmm. in, in East Berlin that had never been torn down or replaced. Whereas West Berlin was quite populous, and, and you know North Korea versus South Korea now at, at night, right. uh, showing all, all the extra development in, in South Korea. Even though you know if you go back to, to 1950 when the, the Koreas separated, they were actually about equally poor, and South Korea has mm -hmm. you know grown significantly, advanced almost uh, close to first world uh, standards of living, and, and North Korea remains one of the poorest places on the planet. And so, you know, looking at these pictures then, what is it about economic freedom in particular, at least, you know, maybe in your opinion, that might allow, you know, entrepreneurs to actually go out and be able to capitalize then on these profit opportunities and to discover, discover these new things? It seems like uh, one of the key elements of this is uh, permissionless, uh, we think of permissionless in innovation, because markets hmm. allow people to uh, do try new things without permission. Now, entrepreneurs might need to get some assistance. So, if an entrepreneur doesn't have the money to start a new venture himself, they'll have to turn to some venture capitalist. So, maybe they might have to recruit or get some people to join in their efforts uh, to, mm -hmm. to try to invent a new product or bring a new idea to the market. But they don't have to really get anybody's permission. Mm -hmm. There's nobody who can say, no, you can't go ahead with that. And all one venture capitalist could say is like, no, I'm not interested in funding that. But that wouldn't prevent another venture capitalist mm -hmm. from, from being able to uh, fund it if they thought it was a, a good idea. So the entrepreneur can make that pitch to different people. And as long as they find somebody willing to support them, they can try it. And they don't have to get any one person's uh, approval. And, and that seems to be very important in, the, in mm -hmm. this whole process. I mean, exactly why you know would probably be a topic from for beyond today's uh, show. But I mean, that seems to be really important. And that seems like it'd be another great opportunity for another show. Then, <laughs> is there anything else you'd like to add? Well, you know, it's still hard to it's still hard to sort of uh, as great as life is today. I mean, it, it is a really important question that we as economists owe, owe it to people to ask and, and, and really sort of as I say. Is this the best it could be? Is this as, is this as good as life could get? Mm -hmm. in, in all of the wonderful innovations we've seen in the market, we still don't have flying cars, <laughs> right. and you know we, we still don't have a, a, a colony on Mars. And you know, at some level, you, you, there, uh, economist Tyler Collins pointed out some things where you know life hasn't can really continue to get better if you look at like well we're travel you know we had air travel back in the 1970s, but we travel at about the same speed as we did. In, in the 1970s, if anything, a little slower because it looked like we were going to have like supersonic uh, transport with the, the Concorde, and, and when the, the Concorde's out of business now. So, in some sense, our travel speeds and some of our other things haven't really uh, improved a lot. And so, we really do owe it to, you know, to everybody mm -hmm. to, to try to address this uh, really hard question as best we can, and I think as honestly as we can as well, because, you know. We have to re re remain humble in this process because right. to sit here and, and money, money more in quarterback and somehow guess or know that uh, we, we could have done better is, is very hard, but it's a question we really have to try to address. Yeah. Well, that sounds great, Dan. Yeah, thanks for that. Well, thanks for coming on and asking these questions, and, and thanks for joining us. Uh, join us again next time for another eConversations.